The official party for this morning's ceremony consists of the Augusta University ROTC Professor of Military Science and host of this afternoon's ceremony, Lieutenant Colonel Jeffrey D. Keenan, Senior Military Instructor, Master Sergeant Kevin File, Executive Director of the Georgia Cyber Center, Colonel Retired Eric Toller, Dr. John Sutherland, Dean, College of Science and Mathematics, and the Commissioning Officers, Cadet Manuel Anderson, Jeremy Bumpers, Malik Harvey, Kalani Hatfield, Chase Inglet, Hunter Kimball, and Ashantia Pullins. The sequence for today's events will be remarks by our guest speaker, the oath of office, pinning ceremony, and silver dollar salute. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, please rise for the national anthem and remain standing for the invocation. Please bow your heads and pray in your faith as I pray in mine. Dear Father, we ask for your hand to be upon our commissioning cadets and their families as they take this next journey of life. We ask that you surround the cadets with your protection and loving care. We thank you for empowering these young adults to walk with faith and love for mankind. We pray that our graduates and second lieutenants are filled with your courage and strength. In your name, we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Augusta University Professor of Military Science, Lieutenant Colonel Jeffrey D. Keenan. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the cadre, staff, and cadets of the Military Science Department at the Augusta University, I wish to welcome you to this morning's spring commissioning ceremony. Thank you to our administration for enabling us to be in person today to celebrate with these cadets. I wish to send uh, a, special guest, a special thank you to our distinguished guest, Dean John Sutherland, the Dean of our College of Science and Math. Sir, it's a privilege to serve as a department chair in your college. Thank you for your leadership and support. I'm grateful for your few subtle knowledges you've given me this year, uh, and you've given me the confidence to engage on key issues for our department. You helped pay, pave a path for our department to move forward. Thank you, sir. Our guest speaker, Colonel Retired Toller, Thank you for your support and your wise counsel this year, sir. We're excited you can join us. Thank you. Also, I extend a special guest to the faculty and members of the administration to include the Dean of Pamplin College, Dean Kim Davies. Thank you for being here today, ma'am. And I'd also like to thank a special recognition to the Department of Military Science cadre and staff. And would you please stand when I call your name? My assistant professors of military science, Captain Will Myers and Captain Jordan Elliott. My battle buddy, Mass Sergeant Kevin File. My outstanding Department of the Army civilians, Ms. Brittany Janice and Mr. Ryan Dim. Uh, Mr. James Ritchie is currently at Fort Knox and cannot be here with us today. I'm truly blessed to work with a talented and dedicated team of professionals. I'm forever grateful for your hard work and your unwavering dedication to, to the development of the very best officers for our Army. Please join me in a round of applause for these great leaders. <laughs> Additionally, I'd like to thank our cadets who could not join us today. We are proud to be part of your journey here at Augusta University. Lastly, to our honored guests, 
our friends and families of our commissioning officers. Welcome to Augusta University. This is truly a special place. And you'll agree with me that there's an indelible mark left on your loved ones by this special institution. Thank you for being a part of today's ceremony. Today is truly a great day to be an American. Thankful that we all are here together in this moment to celebrate these great Americans. Thank you again for being a part of today's ceremony. Jaguar Pride. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Our guest speaker for today, Colonel Retired Eric Toller, joined Augusta University in 2018 as Executive Director of the Georgia Cyber Center. Colonel Toller previously served in the U.S. Army as a military intelligence officer, retiring with over 27 years of leadership and national security experience. During his military career, he was a pioneer in leading and developing cyberspace operations capabilities for the Army and Department of Defense serving in key positions within Army Cyber Command, U.S. Cyber Command, and the National Security Agency. In his role as Executive Director of the Georgia Cyber Center, Colonel Toller is responsible for fulfilling the mission of the Georgia Cyber Center, which is to create an ecosystem of collaboration that helps solve our state's and our nation's most challenging cybersecurity problems through innovative education, training, research, and practical applications between private and public industries. He works with a multitude of partners from government, academia, and private industry to help develop the professional workspace required to secure our state and our nation in cyberspace. Ladies and gentlemen, Colonel Retired Eric Toller. Hey, good morning, team. How's everybody doing? Yeah, what an exciting day for seven new Army officers and their family, friends, and supporters. To Dr. Sutherland and the rest of our illustrious faculty and leaders, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Keenan and the Jaguar Battalion, to all the family, friends of the Army's newest commissioned officers, thank you for being here this morning to celebrate such a special occasion. I can't tell you how excited I am to be here this morning with you. I want to publicly thank Lieutenant Colonel Keenan for this opportunity to speak at your commissioning ceremony. And I don't know if this means more to me or more to, uh, to our future lieutenants here, um, hopefully the latter, but, uh, but I feel very blessed to be part of uh, the beginning of your journey as a commissioned officer in our Army. And I feel like I should turn the podium because most of my comments are really towards these seven individuals here. You know, I know it's hard to believe, um, mainly because I have, still have a full head of hair and, and very little gray, um, okay, maybe not, uh, but I was sitting in the same seat that you were sitting in 31 years ago. Not literally, I was actually in Arkansas, but you know, you get the picture. Uh, and I still remember it like it was yesterday. I remember my fellow classmates, the professor of military science, reciting the oath of office, the NCO that I gave the silver dollar to after my first salute, the whole thing. In fact, um, Dr. Keel's not here, but I actually remember my commissioning much better than I do my graduation. Uh, ironically though, I don't remember a thing about the guest speaker or what they said. Um, absolutely no recollection. Uh, so that tells me I can say just about anything today and get away with it, or at least you won't remember it. <laughs> um, so with that in mind, I'll try to make this as painless as possible. Uh, I do want to take a quick walk through history, not all of history, uh, but a few highlights of my career just to give you an idea of how things will most likely change throughout your career. Uh, then I will try to leave you with three things to remember. Hopefully you'll remember, and I feel like I need a whiteboard so I can write these down for you, but uh, we'll just have to put them in your phone. Um, so I know that Lieutenant Colonel Keenan has already drilled into your heart, mind, and soul how sacred a responsibility it is to lead America's sons and daughters in the defense of our nation. That when you arrive at your first duty station, you will be responsible for accomplishing a vital mission for our Army and be responsible for the lives that you lead. Some of you have already experienced that with prior service. Some will experience that for the first time. I know when I showed up as a second lieutenant in Korea, I was both amazed and humbled 
on how much responsibility I had as a 23-year-old artillery platoon leader. 50 men on the DMZ ready to fight for our country and for each other if the North Korean horde decided to, to venture across the border there. I can now say that I didn't really know what I was doing much of the time, uh, that I was nervous or even scared at times, but it was one of the most exciting and rewarding times of my life. If I could have stayed a platoon leader my whole life and still got paid as a colonel, I would have done that. It doesn't work out that way. But, uh, but to be successful as a junior officer, you just have to work hard. You have to do extra work to become technically and tactically proficient. You have to be confident but humble. Listen to your NCOs and always maintain the moral high ground. We'll talk more about that in a minute. So that was the bonus. So now let's take a quick run through, through history here. So again, I started ROTC in the fall of 1987. Is anybody born in 87? <laughs> uh, I actually enrolled in ROTC as, ROTC as a sophomore. And the threat back then, if you can recall, some of you, was the Soviet Union. And so everything we did for threat and what our tactics were were all about how to stop the Soviet invasion through Germany through the Fulda Gap. And so that's what we studied. In November of 1989, right after I started my senior year, the Berlin Wall fell. The Soviet Union started to collapse, and we were thinking, okay, great, who do we fight now? In May of 1990, I was commissioned as a second lieutenant, although I didn't graduate until the, the, the fall semester, so December. But as I was beginning to start my, senior, or my second senior year, uh, of course, the Iraqi army invaded Kuwait. So there we had it. It's game on again. On the 16th of January, 1991, the air war began. A week after I arrived to Fort Sill, Oklahoma, uh, to start my initial training. They actually rearranged our course, thinking that we were going to get thrown into combat uh, very quickly. And so we learned all the tactical stuff about how to shoot artillery at the very beginning. Um, of course, that war lasted two days and everything was, was back to normal. Um, so I went to my, to my normal assignment in September of 91, arrived in Korea for my first assignment. Uh, not knowing much about that theater, but you learn very quick about who your adversary is, the terrain, and how to defeat the enemy. After Korea, I went to Fort Hood, still focusing on high-intensity conflict. Then went to Fort Huachuca for my MI, Military Intelligence Transition and Advanced Corps. So I'll, here I am four years in, I'm already switching branches. So that's an option for you if you don't like what you're in now. You can always change. Um, December 31st, 95, the U.S. 1st Armored Division crossed the Saba River in Bosnia, which began a two-decade-long peace enforcement mission. Shortly after that, I got stationed in Germany for six years and did a tour in Bosnia for 10 months and a tour in Kosovo. Kind of a roller coaster ride between high-intensity conflict and peace enforcement, continual training. And of course, near the end of my tour, September 11th, 2001, we have the terrorist attack on the World Trade Center in Pentagon. And then everything changed again. The last few months of my tour, uh, we, we, uh, we were prepping for a potential invasion of Iraq for the second time. So we knew early on that that was a, a possibility. In May of 2002, I came back to the States after a wonderful tour in Germany. Went to Command and General Staff College. At that point, I was able to get my master's, so you'll have those opportunities throughout your career. In January of 2004, I went to a, work at a place called NSA. I didn't really even know what it stood for. It was affectionately known as the Puzzle Palace back then. Um, and in addition to two short tours in Iraq, a five-month tour in Afghanistan, that's kind of the assignment that propelled me on this cyber path. Uh, which I'll talk a little bit more about. Summer of 2006, I went to work in the Pentagon. That was my career goal to never work in the Pentagon. So if you have that as a career goal, sorry, you're destined to do that. But I'll, I'll tell you, I did everything I could to get out of that assignment, uh, but it ended up being one of the most rewarding assignments of my career. 
So you will have times in your career that you don't want to do something. But I'll tell you, you got to do every job the best you can, and at the end of it will be very rewarding. Uh, true story of how I got into this cyber business as an intel officer. Uh, me and another major, I was a senior major at the time, we were in the office and our boss, a colonel, walked in and said, hey, which one of you knows what I.O. stands for? And my friend said, intelligence oversight. And two of you will know what that means uh, very well, soon enough. And he goes, no, that's not what I'm looking for. How about you? I said, information operations. He's like, yeah, that's it, come with me. And that was the first meeting we were having at, the, at least the kernel level in the Pentagon about how to create a career field in, in cyber. It wasn't even called that back then. It was computer network operations. Um, so it's funny how your fate changes in, in those moments. Uh, spring 2009, I deployed to Afghanistan for a year tour. So again, sometimes you do things that you don't want to do but you get rewarded in the end. So I did three years in the Pentagon and I got the two dream jobs that I wanted. One was a deployment with the 82nd Airborne in Afghanistan. The second one was a battalion command. And the, the command I, or the battalion I commanded, I actually created when I was working in the Pentagon. That was our first Army Network Warfare Battalion. Uh, after command, I led a joint cyber team uh, which is now called combat mission team so you probably saw that we retaliated against the russian group called dark side for the attack on our uh, pipeline colonial pipeline so those are the teams that, that do that i can either confirm or deny that they actually did that but that's probably what happened i went on to national war college in dc a phenomenal experience i uh, was the j2 or the senior intelligence officer for the cyber national mission force the operational element under u.s cyber command and then came to wonderful Georgia in 2015 as the commander of NSA Georgia. Uh, 6,000 men and women doing God's work. It was absolutely the best assignment of my life. So it does get better. Uh, you don't have to stay a platoon leader all your life. Um, you know, after command, I still had two kids in high school, uh, junior and senior, wanted to keep them here, so I volunteered to deploy again. So my third tour in Afghanistan. And during that tour is when I decided to uh, to stay here and take the opportunity at the Georgia Cyber Center. So I wasn't planning on retiring, uh, but this opportunity came along and I, I applied and got accepted and then I put in my retirement paperwork. So they always say, I don't know, you know, when do you know when it's time to step away and be an opportunity knocks and you just have to make that call. So that kind of gives you an idea of the roller coaster uh, career that the Army can be. It's not always easy, especially on families. I know some of you are married already. Uh, but what an incredible and rewarding experience in almost 28 years. What your career will look like will be partially up to you. You'll get to make choices. It'll be partially up to the Army and partially up to circumstances, as you just heard. The threats that you will face will ebb and flow from powerful nation states like China and Russia to the continuous terrorist threat to humanitarian assistance and everything in between. Your doctrine will adjust to the threat environment, but one thing that's clear is that this thing called cyber and information warfare will be here for a while. So whether you call it multi-domain operations or full spectrum operations, you gotta know it all. Uh, so that was interesting, but what do you need to remember? So back to the three things. The best advice I ever received was that you will be the best manager of your own career. So you'll have an assignments officer that will guide you and provide you with assignments that will help you become a more well-rounded officer. But at the end of the day, uh, their responsibility is to fill the needs of the Army. Uh, you'll have to leverage your leaders and mentors along the way, but have a plan to be where you want to be and do what's best for your family and make the best of every assignment. Number two, guard your reputation. Yeah, Emily, write that down. Guard your reputation, and I don't mean that in a conceited way, quite the opposite. 
as you go through your career, you will start building a reputation that will spread very quickly. When you're a lieutenant or junior captain, you'll be known across your brigade. Senior captain major across your division or corps, and pretty soon you'll be known across the Army. You don't need to be perfect, but you need to be known for your work ethic, for your integrity, and as a team player. Just like in the private sector, you'll need to build your network and try to pick up some mentors along the way. To give you an example of what I mean, when I became a battalion commander, I personally knew 80 to 90 percent of all the other battalion commanders in, in the MI Corps. As a brigade commander, I knew them all. And guess what? We all talk. And so when, when officers are changing organizations, the first thing you do is call the, the, uh, the losing commander and say, tell me about this man or woman. Should I take them into my unit? And so if you have that great reputation, we don't have to do interviews. It's almost taken. Take it for the word of your buddy on the other side. So finally, let me finish with a note on leadership philosophy. So I was able to find one of my old command philosophies, so I'm just going to read you these eight pages of leadership imperatives. Okay, I'm kidding. You're like, oh my gosh, this is getting long winded. So as a company commander, battalion commander, and a brigade commander, my leadership philosophy was eight words. Love your teammates and do what's right. Love your teammates and do what's right. It's pretty simple, easy to remember. Some might think a bit odd and well, about love, but, but let's unpack this a bit. So what is love? So a wise man once said, greater love has no man than this, and to lay down one's life for his friends. Now in that context, that's actually Jesus talking to his disciples, telling them that he's going to give his life up for the sins of the world. But in your context, you're about to take an oath of office. And you're going to swear or affirm to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. The implied task in that is you're willing to give up your life for your fellow countrymen and for your soldiers. That's love. So who are your teammates? Your fellow soldiers as you get into joint operations, your other service members that you'll be responsible for, your civilians and contractors. Believe it or not, the, uh, the DOD civilians take the exact same oath that you're about to take. So they're your teammates. It could be other nations. But when you build your team, make sure you take care of them. And how do you know what right is? That's a big debate these days. There are plenty of statutes and regulations and policies you'll get to follow that will tell you what right is, or at least tell you what wrong is, and then you can extrapolate from there what right is. There's a lot of don't do this, don't do that. Uh, but you will still face ethical and moral dilemmas that either aren't addressed in policy, or you might choose to ignore them. I'll give you one quick example. You've probably heard of blood wings or blood rank. Anybody experience that? Been to jump school? Out of air, we have at least one air assault. Where you get your, your badge or your rank and people come up and just drive those pins into your chest and I guess that's supposed to make you feel manly or womanly or whatever it is. Anybody done that? So my second week in company command, I had a specialist getting promoted to sergeant. My opinion, the most important promotion in the Army because you go from a soldier to a leader. And I was... As I was you know, observing the after part of this ceremony, you know, soldiers were coming up and shaking his hand, but some of the NCOs were coming up and just pounding those stripes into his chest. And he's turning red, and you could tell he was in pain. And what did I do? I just kind of watched it. But it didn't sit well with me. And so the next day, I talked to my command sergeant major. And I talked to my, my entire company. I said, we're not going to do that anymore. 
You know, we can be tough, we're soldiers, but this is a celebration of an accomplishment and we're not gonna humiliate people, particularly when their families are there. So I just share that with you as one example of doing what right is. You can make your own choices, but that's just how I felt. You have to be the moral compass of your soldiers. And in some cases, your peers and your leaders. You can't look the other way when something is wrong. You can't say one thing and do another. When you compromise your integrity, it's hard to recover from that ever. If your soldiers and your leaders don't trust you, you will become completely ineffective. So back to the question, how do you know what right is? So this is my personal belief and my personal opinion. And I hard before you leave today, and I'm very sincere about that. So God bless you. God bless your families. God bless our great nation. And go Jags! Thank you, sir. On behalf of the Jaguar Battalion, the Cadet Executive Officer, Cadet Hatfield, will present a token of our appreciation. Commission officers are responsible for leading and training enlisted soldiers, planning missions, and organizing the internal and external affairs of the Army. They are part of a unique club that includes George Washington, Ulysses S. Grant, George Patton, Dwight D. Eisenhower, and Douglas MacArthur. Officers are entrusted with the welfare, morale, and professional development of the soldiers under their command. As such, the Army grants officership to only the most qualified, talented men and women. Ladies and gentlemen, to administer the oath, Lieutenant Colonel Jeffrey D. Keenan. The first oaths of office were given to those serving under the Continental Army. Beginning in 1775, a candidate had to not only name the 13 states, but also swear to keep them free, independent, and sovereign states, and declare no allegiance to George III, King of Great Britain as well as defend the United States against King George, his heirs and successors, and his and their betters, assistants, and adherents. It was first updated in September 1776 after the Declaration of Independence to swear to be true to the United States of America and to serve them honestly and faithfully against all their enemies, opposers whatsoever, and to obey and observe the orders of the Continental Congress and the orders of the generals and officers set over me by them. This was changed in 1789 to place allegiance to the Constitution of the United States at the beginning of the oath. It remained relatively unchanged until the 1860s. At this point, the reference to them was replaced with it to reflect the realities of the divided nation during the American Civil War, as well as the shifting attitude of viewing the United States as one entity rather than a collection of smaller ones. In 1884, it was simplified to having the candidates solemnly swear or affirm to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign or domestic, to bear a true faith and allegiance to the same, to take this obligation freely without any mental reservation or purpose of evasion, and to well and faithfully discharge the duties of the office on which I am about to enter. So help me God. This was the oath until 1959, when it found its current form. At this time, please rise for the ministering of the oath. Attention to the oath. I, I, I have been appointed second lieutenant in the United States Army. United, United States, States Army. Army. You solemnly swear. I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States, the Constitution of the United States against, all enemies, against all enemies, foreign and domestic. Born and domestic. I bear true faith. I don't bear true faith. And allegiance to the same. And allegiance to the same. That I take this obligation freely. That I take this obligation freely. Without any mental reservation. Without any mental reservation. For purpose of evasion. For purpose of evasion. That I will well and faithfully. I will well and faithfully discharge the duties. Discharge the duties of the office upon which. The office upon which I'm about to enter. I'm about to enter. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations.
this time, Cadet Anderson will have his oath of office administered by Captain Justice Anderson. I, Emmanuel Anderson, do solemnly swear to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign or domestic. I bear true faith and allegiance to the same. I, I take this obligation freely, with no mental reservation or purpose of evasion. the duties of the office I'm about to enter. So help me God. Thank you, sir. At this time, Cadet Bumpers will have his oath of office administered by his wife, Major April Bumpers. Jeremy T. Bumpers. Having been appointed an, arm, an officer in the Army of the United States. As indicated above in the grade of second lieutenant. As indicated above in the grade of second lieutenant. You solemnly swear. That I will support and defend the Constitution of the United States. Against all enemies. Against all enemies. Foreign and domestic. Foreign and domestic. That I will bear true faith. And I will bear true faith. And allegiance to the same. And allegiance to the same. That I take this obligation. That I take this obligation. Freely. Freely. Without any mental reservation. Without any mental reservation. Or purpose of evasion. Or purpose of evasion. And that I will well and faithfully discharge. That I will well and faithfully discharge. The duties of the office. The duties of the office. On which I'm about to enter. On which that I'm about to enter. So help me God. And finally, at this time, Cadet Pollins will have her oath of office administered by Lieutenant Colonel Sharon Jordan. President of the United States of America, to all who shall see these presents, greeting. Know ye that reposing special trust and confidence in the patriotism, valor, fidelity, and abilities of Emanuel Anderson, I do appoint him Second Lieutenant, Military Intelligence. 
Jeremy Bumpers, I do appoint him Second Lieutenant Signal Corps. Malik Harvey, I do appoint him Second Lieutenant Quartermaster Corps. Kaylani Hatfield, I do appoint her Second Lieutenant Chemical Corps. Chase Inglet, I do appoint him Second Lieutenant Military Intelligence. Hunter Kimball, I do appoint him Second Lieutenant Quartermaster Corps. And Ashanti Pullins, I do appoint her Second Lieutenant Quartermaster Corps. In the United States Army, as such, from the 15th day of May 2021. These officers will therefore carefully and diligently discharge the duties of the office to which appointed by doing and performing all manner of things thereunto belonging. And I do strictly charge and require those officers and other personnel of lesser rank to render such obedience as is due an officer of this grade and position. And this officer is to observe and follow such orders and directives from time to time as may be given by me or the future president of the United States of America or other superior officers acting in accordance with the laws of the United States of America. This commission is to continue in force during the pleasure of the president of the United States of America for the time being under the provisions of those public laws relating to officers of the armed forces of the United States of America and the component thereof in which this appointment is made. Signed, John E. Whitley. Ladies and gentlemen, it is our honor to present our great Army's newest second lieutenants from Augusta University, Army ROTC, second lieutenants Anderson, Bumpers, Harvey, Hatfield, Inglet, Kimball, and Pullins. <laughs> At this time, family and friends designated for the pinning ceremony, please move forward to pin your officers. Second Lieutenant Emanuel Anderson will begin his career as an active duty military intelligence officer in Fort Stewart, Georgia. He has earned a Master's of Education in Counselor Education with an emphasis in clinical mental health counseling. Second Lieutenant Anderson is a distinguished military graduate for 2021. He is being pinned by his wife, Jennifer Anderson. Second Lieutenant Anderson will attend basic officer leadership course at Fort Huachuca, Arizona. Second Lieutenant Jeremy Bumpers will begin his career as a signal officer. He has earned a Bachelor's of Science in Kinesiology. He is being penned by his mother, Angie of Fort Worth, Texas, and his best friend, Captain Anderson. Second Lieutenant Bumpers will attend Basic Officer Leadership Course at Fort Gordon, Georgia. Second Lieutenant Malik Harvey will begin his career as a Quartermaster Officer in Fort Bliss, Texas. He has earned a bachelor's in mathematics and is the 2021 Distinguished Military Student. He is being pinned by Shaquille Harvey, Hakeem Harvey, and Elite Harvey, Master Officer in South Korea. She has earned a master's in public health. She is being pinned by Nina Holliday and Mary Ann Mitchell. Second Lieutenant Pullins will attend Basic Officer Leadership Course at Fort Lee, Virginia. At this time, family and friends may be seated unless conducting a silver dollar salute. The new lieutenants will now conduct the silver dollar salute. While no one knows for sure where this tradition originated, some suggest that it was passed on from British regiments garrisoned in the United States during the colonial era. Of course, at the time, it would not have been a dollar as we know it today. As the story goes, some of their traditions and customs were passed on to newly formed American units. New officers were assigned an enlisted advisor who showed them the ropes, taught them the regimental history as well as the ins and out of the military profession. Lieutenants compensated their enlisted advisors with a small sum of money. American second lieutenants in the early 1800s received about $25 monthly as base pay, a rations allowance of about $3, and an additional allowance of $1 for their enlisted advisor. While the advisor's pay was eventually discontinued, the responsibility for mentoring the newly commissioned officer continued. This relationship is thought to be the basis for this tradition. By tradition, the silver dollar is the only coin given in exchange for the first salute. While the coin may be just one dollar in denomination, it represents a value far greater. To new officers, it may represent the respect found in one's newly earned rank and position. A twist on the thinking for the silver dollar salute is that the new officer must buy his first salute as he is not yet, by the nature of his deed alone, earned it.
At this time, Second Lieutenant Anderson will receive his first salute from his wife, Staff Sergeant Retired Jennifer Anderson. Second Lieutenant Bumpers will receive his first salute from his mother-in-law, Specialist Six, Betty Powers. Second Lieutenant Harvey will receive his first salute from his brother, Private Second Class, Rashawn Wilder. Second Lieutenant Hatfield will receive her first salute from the Senior Military Instructor, Master Sergeant Kevin File. Second Lieutenant Inglet will receive his first salute from Sergeant First Class, John Ford. Second Lieutenant Kimball will receive his first salute from Sergeant Brendan Hunter. And finally, Second Lieutenant Pullins will receive her first salute from Sergeant First Class Retired, Rhonda Stockton. At this time, you may take your seats. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, if you may, please rise for the playing of the Army song. This concludes our ceremony. Please move to the front to congratulate the newest officers of the United States Army. Thank you for attending and have a good weekend.